What's up guys, Devin is back with some more plant vibrations. And last night I was trying to fall asleep and I had this light bulb pop into my head for what I think would be a pretty fun video. So the premise behind this video is all about troubleshooting why our plants might not be as happy or growing as fast as they possibly could. And in my mind, there are five, really five main factors which need to be considered in order to create the plants um, most perfect environment so that they can grow at their optimum. So let's get right into it. All right, so the five factors that you really need to consider when we're trying to create the perfect envir environment for each plant is number one, lighting. Number two would be the warmth or coolness of the location where you're growing your plant. Um, the third factor would be the water. Too much water, not enough water. The fourth factor would be the amount of root space. So for potted plants, that would be like the size of the container. If it's too big, not large enough, or plants in the garden, if they're competing with other plants that may be already established, maybe there's not enough root space for new plants to be introduced into that area of the garden. And the fifth factor would be the soil, the soil medium and or the ability of that of water to actually drain away from the roots of the plants. So I wanted to give some good examples and show what problems associated with each of those five factors might look like and why they're not in their optimal. So before we kind of get started into showing each of those plants, I wanted to just kind of give you guys a little look. We're here in Bogota. Um, now this is not my primary residence. This is my girlfriend's apartment here in Colombia. And for the last year, two years, I've been kind of traveling back and forth. And while I'm here, we buy a lot of plants together. And while I'm here, I'm definitely the, you know, the prime house plant parent. Um, but while I'm not here, Samantha is really in charge of the plants. And while she is a new, a newbie plant mama, um, she's finding her love for plants. She doesn't have as much experience as I do. And you know, I have more experience, but that doesn't mean that I get plants right all the time either. I fail with plants all the time, like everyone does. So the first and foremost, if a plant is really failing, don't be harsh on yourself. Plants, you know, it takes time to understand plants. Um, but that being said, Samantha's still learning what her plants need. And some of the plants have not necessarily, she's behind the camera filming right now. So don't get mad at me, but some of the plants may not have been cared for in exactly the right way that they should have been. Um, but it created an awesome video topic to kind of show. So the very first or the second, third, fourth, one thing you should do when you get a new plant, do a little bit of research, whether that means going online to YouTube and ask or looking for videos from someone that you trust like Plant Vibrations or going to other websites. Um, a website that I use all the time is the Missouri Botanical Gardens website. Um, they have pretty much every plant listed that I've ever looked. They have, a, they have a listing for that plant. They give where the plant is native to, certain cultural requirements that those plants need. They really, they really give you all of like a condensed version of what you need to think about when um, growing your new plants. And so that is kind of what leads to the next thing is, is you really want to try to emulate those native conditions as best as possible when you're, when you're trying, when you're growing a new plant and um, keeping these five factors in mind that is really the, the, the five main factors which create a climate, which create the conditions that the plants need in order to grow their very best. So I wanted to, start with lighting because to me that is really definitely the number one problem I see with a lot of houseplant parents, um, plant parents generally speaking, is the lighting. Plants are, houseplants, indoor plants are actually of course outdoor plants obviously. All plants are outdoor plants but when we grow them inside and the lighting is coming in through the window you have to imagine, okay, if you are standing in the full sun outside on a summer's day for 10 hours in that full blazing sun, you'd probably get burnt. But if you're standing 
in that same exact sun with a window pane in front of you, chances of you getting burnt very slim. So that's kind of just a way to think about the light intensity of being outside in the freshness versus behind that window pane. A lot of the intensity of the light is totally lost. That being said, it's really important to have plants with great lighting. Even plants that are low light level plants probably need to be pretty close to a window. Now, Samantha, she loves to have plants all over the house and I don't blame her, I do too. I'm a little bit more realistic and I keep my plants near a bright, like near a window. If not near a window, I keep them with artificial lighting um, and I'm a big proponent of using artificial lighting, using just a bulb to illuminate a light. Even during the summer, I do that year round at my house in Pennsylvania. If you haven't seen my house plant jungle yet, uh, go check or one, one of those sides, go check my house, my complete house plant tour of my garden outside of Philadelphia. And you'll see that I use a lot of like supplementary lighting. Now, like I was saying, Samantha likes to have her plants in various locations around the apartment, which aren't necessarily all by that window. Case in point, this pothos. Um, I, you know, I don't want to argue with her. I, she, it makes her happy to have plants in all the locations and I want her to be happy. So I don't I try not to say anything, but you can see that the pothos, it's it kind of, some of the foliage is starting to look a little bit lackluster. It's not as vibrant. It's not growing as quickly. In fact, it really hasn't been filling out at all over the past few months because it's been just too far away from the windows, from the light source. Um, a lot of times she will find that I had moved the pothos closer to the window source, uh, but sometime must be when I'm sleeping, it gets moved back into the kitchen. I don't know how it happens. It just does. Uh, but anyways, you can understand that the further you get away from that window, from that light source, the light intensity, it's, you know, it just gets less and less and less. This needs to be in a higher light level um, in order to be happy. Um, and I will be constantly moving it back and forth to try to give it that supplementary light. So this is a good opportunity to see of a plant that isn't getting quite enough lighting. It's just not growing as quickly. It's not filling out. Um, it's not creating new growth hardly as rapidly as it should be. Um, but let's go to the next plant, which is getting too much lighting, which can also be the case. All right, so now we're gonna see a plant that has been getting too much light. And that would be the Calathea zebrina. Um, this plant is actually native to like the southeastern part of Brazil in the very warm climate jungles. It's hot, it's humid. Um, but this is a plant that is grown in the understory of large trees. It gets pretty much like deep, deep shade all the time. And that's what it loves. So knowing that, why did I put this plant near this window in, in such a nice brightly lit location? You can see it looks horrible. It's like flailing. Um, the pot is absolutely beautiful. Samantha spent like four days pa painting up this gorgeous pot. Um, but it, makes me sad to say that I'm gonna to have to change this container because while um, the reason I put it near this light is because as soon as I potted it up into this plant, into this planter, I noticed that it just started to get floppy. Um, I had had it where I thought was a good spot, kind of like in the kitchen, away from the light, in, in a location that was kind of like the appropriate light level for, for what I would think it would want, but it was just not looking good. So that brings me to the next point, which would be the, like the warmth or coolness of the temperature where the plant is growing. So like I was saying, this is from like the, the really warm jungly areas of Brazil where it's like 70, 75 all the time. Now here in Bogota, it, it's kind of like 55 degrees all the time. Our apartment, I don't think any apartments really have any sort of central heating. I'm constantly freezing in this apartment. Likewise, so is our Calathea. You put your hands on here and it's absolutely frigid. Now, when we got the plant, it was planted up in kind of like a plastic bag, very you know inexpensive plastic bag, and it was lush, it was looking beautiful. I put it in this terracotta and it just went by the wayside. And what I finally realized after a couple weeks of like, Mm, trying to figure out what the heck is the deal, why it's not looking. When I'm having all the other, you know, factors at their, at, 
where they should be at their equilibrium, I came to realize that this beautiful terracotta, it just retains too, or like it keeps the heat out. It doesn't warm up fast enough and it just stays cool. So here in a little bit, I'm gonna repot this up into a plastic container. Plastic containers, you know, they allow the heat to enter much more easily. Yes, it allows the heat to kind of diffuse away as well, but I think that it will be a better choice. Um, so when we're thinking about like the climate, you know, we need to really consider its native areas, what kind of climates that they're used to in order to make sure that their root system is at the temperature that they want it to be. So if it doesn't work with the plastic pot, I don't really, I'll, I kind of will be at my wits end. If, it, if we just can't keep it warm enough in here, maybe I'll wrap a blanket around it. I'm really not sure. Stay tuned and we will see and find out. But on the flip side, there can also be the occasions where the warmth of your apartment or house is too much and the plant doesn't want that. So let's go look at another plant which actually prefers to have some good coolness in its environment. <laughs> Can I just mention that when I was prepping for this video, I accidentally broke this off and I've behind the camera is a very deep frown from Samantha. This orchid, this um, Phalaenopsis has been blooming for the last eight months. It is amazing. Um, I have a really nice video all about Phalaenopsis care. Uh, you can check it out to see how to get your orchids to bloom for a long time. Okay, so if you've ever grown a Phalaenopsis orchid before, and let's say you live in Southern California where it stays pretty much warm all the year round, you bring it home, it has nice blooms and the flowers finish and it never reblooms. What the heck? What is the deal? You're trying everything. Well, the thing about an orchid is that if you did your research and you found out what sort of cultural conditions they need, they actually need a kind of like a 10 to 20 degree Fahrenheit differential between the day temperatures and the night temperatures in order to create new flowers. So this is a plant you really need to give it the coolness in the nights in order to create new flowers. And look, this is just, this has been blooming and blooming and blooming. Hopefully, I don't, hopefully it will create some more flowers here to make Samantha happy. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. She's giving me a bad look right now. But anyway, so this is a good example of knowing that your plant needs cool temperatures in order to create more flower buds. Another good example would be like your Christmas cactus or your um, other various orchid cactus. Okay, so part three, or if the third factor would be the level of water that you're giving your plant. So, you know, most of us are familiar with the fact that succulents hold moisture in their foliage. They don't, not all succulents, but most, many succulents like to allow their soil to really get dried out between waterings. And what happens if you water too much and the soil stays moist too long is that your foliage will start to get yellow and die. But I, you know, I'm not gonna talk about that one too much. It's pretty, most of us are familiar about too much watering. But on the flip side, what happens if you don't give your plant enough water? So alternatively, if your plant is not getting sufficient moisture, then it also won't grow appropriately. It won't grow as it should. If you follow me on Instagram at plant.vibrations, you may have seen recently that I posted a picture of this beautiful tree philodendron. It's like a thomatophyllum binatophyllum, blah, 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 something, some long Latin name like that. Um, and I had mentioned that this produced its first leaf in eight months. That's not good, that's not right. That means one of those five factors was incorrect and I didn't. I couldn't figure it out. I, I gave it good sunlight, I gave it what I thought was enough water, has good soil, awesome drainage. So what is the deal? Well, it turns out that these plants, they need to be remaining moist all the, pretty much all of the time in order to be at their optimum level. And as soon as I started to water this like every single day, I got a new leaf. But you really shouldn't have to water your plants every single day, which takes us into factor number, what number are we actually on? 
we're on number four. So this takes us into factor number, yeah, I have some notes. This is a longish video, so st stay tuned. I think we have more good stuff coming. Um, anyway, factor number four is basically the size of the container and or the root space available. And I realize that this is just in too small of a container. I shouldn't have to water it every single day. And the reason why I shouldn't have to is because it should be in a larger container with more space for the roots to grow. And with more root space, more soil space, um, I can water it less frequently, but it will remain moist. So as we're going through each of these kind of examples, we're seeing how the five factors interplay. Of course, we w in a perfect world, we would get all five factors at that great equilibrium where the plant is as happy as can be in its most natural native conditions, but it's not always plausible or it's not even, it's not always reasonable to, to achieve all five of them. Sometimes maybe one of those is kind of impossible to achieve. Well, and this is a great case where I could have given it a larger pot and it would have allowed it to remain moist. Giving it the right moisture would have been more easily attained. So what I'm actually going to do as I take that calathea that we just saw, I'm going to take that out and put it into a plastic pot. I'm going to use that pot, which is larger than this one, and pot, th pot this baby up. So another plant um, that has also been suffering from a container that is too small, a plant that's in much too small of a container. This guy has been flailing since day one, and it's my fault. I thought it would, you know, fill out the root system in here and still grow. I forgot the cardinal rule. This is a very general, general kind of rule, but think about it this way. If a plant is gonna grow three feet up, you really wanna give it like three feet down worth of root space. A very, very general rule, but it's a good rule of thumb, I think. Um, so I'm gonna transfer this to a container that's deeper, and I'm probably gonna watch it grow much bigger. So I have a bigger pot that we're gonna pot this one up as well. And as we pot this up, I think either one of two things is, is going to become evident. Either number one, the roots will have been tang you know, filling out this entire container, or the roots have kind of stuck in this kind of little circle right around, touched the base of this um, square uh, window box and stopped growing all together. I, I'm gonna guess that it's one of those two, okay? So we're gonna pop this up here in a, here in a second. And the fifth and final uh, factor that we need to consider is kind of like the soil medium and or the ability for drainage to occur. And a great plant, you know, I'd say like nine and a half times out of 10, you buy a potted bag of potting mix from the big box store and that's gonna be a-okay for your plants. But, you know, once in a while, you need to kind of get a little bit creative and create your own blend to make your plants happy. And a great plant that I think every house plant garden should have is a wonderful anthurium. This is like the anthurium classic flamingo flower. I think anthurium andranum. I don't know if my pronunciation is correct, but I have some good videos all about how to, how, how to grow these successfully. And they're such beautiful plants, often able to produce flowers. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll remember that this is actually the flower. Um, this is just a colored leaf, actually. But they can provide color inside the home all year round. It's so great. One thing that these really need though, they need great moist, they need to ha remain moist in the soil, but they also need to have great drainage. So when I used to plant this up in just general potting mix, the potting mix would stay moist, but it would just kind of get like waterlogged. There wasn't good airflow and the plants would just, they wouldn't be very happy. You could just visually tell they weren't happy. So what I started to do would, would uh, I would mix like 50% bagged potting mix with a blend of like orchid bark and some moss. And what happened was the drainage improved. I would water and you could see the water just flow right out of it, but it would remain moist. And the plants absolutely loved it and thrived and grew so much faster. So considering like the potting medium, you know, online you can often find really good recipes for various types of house plants somehow some house plants need kind of a little bit of a special blend um anthuriums are a great a great one that needs that special blend and then another thing kind of along the line of drainage 
would be, you know, containers don't always need to have drainage holes in the bottom, but if you can add drainage holes, it's normally gonna help. Roots, they need to, they need to be able to breathe and having drainage holes is gonna be help, is gonna be very helpful. So what do you do when there's no hole? If, you know, you have a drill, a drill is better, but I don't have any tools here. We're just kind of, I've got my kitchen, a little kitchen knife. And so just take a knife, do this carefully. Not while you're filming a video is probably the best time to do it. Get it in like that and just kind of go around till you have a hole that's reasonable enough. A hole that you can easily see through is a good size, okay? So adding drainage is going to help keep aeration. It's going to give your plants that right kind of soil, medium, air, water combination to make your plants happy. And that's the fifth and final factor. So now that we know the five factors, I think it's time. Let's go upstairs. Let's go to the roof. Samantha won't let me plant in here. She says it's too messy. So we're going to go to the roof and plant up the calathea, we're gonna replant this philodendron and this gorgeous little baby hydrangea. Okay, let's go. All right, welcome to Columbia. <laughs> Okay, so you see I have um, our tree philodendron, our hydrangea, and the calathea. And um, this calathea is really breaking my heart. Uh, I'm about to do something I don't recommend. I repotted this up like a week ago, and I'm about to repot it up again. I didn't give it a month or two to rebound to see how it would go, but it's just been kind of getting worse and worse. So I'm gonna break, you know, rules are meant for breaking, right? All right. So first, I'm just really curious to see what the root system looks like underneath this hydrangea. One thing my dad always told me, you know, I've been working with my dad and my family for my whole life with plants. And he always said, if you can't figure out what's going wrong, you gotta go beneath the hood. It's like a car. You gotta check out the roots. What's going on with the roots, the root system. And oftentimes you can get clues of why your plant might not be doing so good. So let's take this one out. Let's check it out. The roots have started to really come all the way around the container. And as they start to fill this out, there's really no more space for roots to grow, which means it's probably not gonna create any more up top growth. All right, so that's kind of, you know, I was right, wasn't I? I got, I already said it would either be totally filled out or kind of just circled in. So it was totally filled out. We're gonna pot it up, give it more soil. Um, and a, a deeper pot, so that's gonna be great. Another thing is, sometimes if you see that a plant is really kind of stuck in its growth and it's not expanding anymore, giving it fresh soil with a slightly larger pot so can often solve a lot of problems. So keep, something to keep in mind. All right, now let's check this one out. Ugh, this guy's gonna be hard to get out. Ooh. Okay, some of the roots got left, unfortunately, but you can see these roots are gorgeous and this plant definitely wants, this is totally compacted root growth. Look at that, as they start to circle up, that means that it needs a new pot, a larger pot, if you want it to continue to be happy, all right? This is never a good sign other than it's time to pot up, okay? So before we repot it, just always tease those roots a little bit, break them up. They need to be broken up, they need to be revitalized because they've kind of been circling in amongst themselves and they need some, some new life added into them, all right?
I almost always recommend potting things into totally fresh soil, but the soil is still really nice and dark, which means there's still some good nutrients left into it. This is going to be so much happier, I'm telling you. Okay, as we let this water soak in, I had to move our calathea over there because it was just way too darn windy. So let's move, let's move over here. Now, like I was saying, I just repotted this up last week. So this soil is all really nice and fresh still. A little bit at the base. Samantha's sad that I just got it a little bit dirty, but that will wash off with water, no problem. So definitely not as pretty as this beautiful hand-painted pot, which I just got dirty and Samantha's kind of giving me that eye again, but I'm going to clean it up and show her that it's okay. Not as pretty, but I think the plant will be happier and a happier plant is a prettier plant, right? Okay. Hide this here from the wind for a minute. Go plant up that philodendron. Now we're about to plant this into a much larger container. I am really thrilled. This is, I can't wait to see this guy take off. I've been really sad watching it do nothing for the last eight months. Alright, so now we have our three freshly potted up plants, which hopefully will have kind of rectified um, those factors that were a little bit out of balance, a little bit out of whack. And hopefully in the next month or so, these are going to start to grow as they should and be much happier. And if you want to stick along with me on the journey, make sure to go to my Plant Vibrations Instagram page. It's at plant.vibrations where I'm very active posting stuff every single day um, but you know with those five factors in mind I'm promising you that you can find the secret the, the sweet spot the secret sauce secret recipe whatever you want to call it for each of the plants in your houseplant jungle in your patio garden or outside in your outdoor garden um, those are they're really like the, the five main things that need to be considered for any plants happiness um, and with that in mind I, I know that you can become you know a little bit better of a, a little bit more caring a little bit more loving of a plant parent and your plants are going to love you just that much more anyways i hope you enjoyed this rather long video i spoke quite a lot hope it was entertaining engaging educational um, make sure to leave some comments below if you have any of the any other video topics that you would like me to discuss in the future, always looking for new fresh ideas. So thanks for joining me along tonight and being a part of my plant vibrations journey. Anyways, I will catch you guys soon. Ciao.